Hey, Mary. Hi, Gary. <laughs> we rhyme. Hey, everybody. <laughs> We're so glad you're here. Thank you. Thank you for this precious day. Every one of you. So I think we should start with a story. Let's do that. Yeah. yeah. Six years ago, miserable rainy morning, and I almost didn't drive from Portland, Oregon to Red Lodge, Montana. I'd promised a college friend that I would finally take spring break to come meet his family, but I was running late, and it was a long drive. Somehow, I made it into the car, through the Columbia Gorge, and clear to Montana anyway, where, by some remarkable chance, I meet this guy a conservation science writer who's been walking around the wilderness for 30 years and writing books about it. He's on his 27th book as we speak. So then, eight months later, on the banks of Rock Creek, right here in the Rockies, I get to marry this woman. A social scientist, a tenured full professor, author of more than 100 articles, two books of her own, a road warrior who'd driven around the country twice to learn what Americans meant when they said the word change. And this is what happened next. We walked. We walked and we walked to the tops of mountains and down into valleys of the Absorca, Beartooth, and Gallatin Ranges, through the city streets and forested parks of Portland, even along the Pacific coast of Mexico. And we talked, sharing our passions about what we'd learned in the years before we met. Gary told me some really cool stuff about genetics. Like the fact that you share more than 50% of your DNA with redwoods, and 90% with your cat, <laughs> and 99% with chimpanzees, which made Mary think of some things shared between humans. Yep, back in the 70s, Eleanor McAbee and Carol Jacklin took a close look at all the data comparing biological males and females and found way more overlap than difference in physical ability, in intelligence, in verbal and social skills. Then another group of women researchers took a look at thousands of adult learners to find that we all learn better when we're connected when we're collaborative, when we support each other. This riffing between us was like jazz. Every fact of conservation science I put out there, Mary matched with a fact of social science, and pretty soon we began to understand that underneath all this, knowledge was a deeper kind of grounding. Everything that we talked about pointed to interdependence, to connection. And soon it became very clear that we humans have everything we need to survive and to thrive. So this is Full Ecology. Full Ecology invites you back home, back to your human nature, back to humans as nature. We forget that we are the natural world. And that if we want to take care of that world, we really need to take care of the ecology between us and inside of us. Whether we're talking about elephants or public schools, tide pools or memory and dreams, we're talking about ecologies. Everything in the natural environment and everything in our personal and social ecologies is connected. It's full ecology. Out in the forest, the trees talk to each other. Even different kinds of trees using underground fungal networks, the older trees can send food to young, hungry ones. They can use those networks to send electrical or chemical signals to warn other trees of insect attacks. We also know that in our human networks, we too are connected. For example, we've known for about 50 years that infants who are securely connected to the adults in their lives heal more quickly from illness, and are more likely to have strong friendship networks as adults and children. We're also learning that we're much less likely to get dementia when we sustain active friendships into our older years. 
We know that social support helps us with recovery from addiction and can activate coping skills for living well in the wake of trauma. Our human connections help health and well-being circulate. And that circulation goes on outdoors too. Just being under a tree, the carbon dioxide you breathe out nourishes the tree, while the oxygen that the tree releases is just what you need. And not just oxygen. Trees release something that biologists have identified as phytoncides, chemicals that actually fortify your immune system, even strengthen your heart. So we really are all in this together. Try something. Look down at your feet. Really. Ready? Okay. Now let your eyes move just enough to the right or the left to catch a look at the shoes a person next to you is wearing. Linger there a few seconds. Consider where that person has walked has rested, has been. You can never know the whole story, but you can bet that person has been through plenty from birth to here, just like you. That person, just like you, has drawn breath containing molecules that have been circling the planet for millions of years, has consumed water, filtered through soils and stone, recycled eons after eons, conveyed by springs and rivers, by pipes made out of extracted metals into homes and then back out again. You may or may not ever be in ongoing relationship with the person whose shoes you considered. Fact is, your lives are intersecting right now. You're breathing the same air. You're listening to the same stories. Think about it. What affects your well-being affects theirs. We're in interdependence, no matter what. But we tend to forget such things. Mary, you said that we're in the most technically connected, yet socially disconnected time in human history. We really are interdependent, but we often act like we're completely separate. No wonder we're so lonely. Oh, lonely and busy. We don't even have time to consider our disconnection. Lots of you are parents. You may have noticed that time in infancy when a baby has no sense of being an individual, no sense of me and you, of this and that. Here's the way that the idea of separation takes hold in the first place. Imagine a baby in a high chair, munching on Cheerios. You reach for one of her brightly colored toys, say, a rattle. You shake it in front of her and she giggles. And then you hide it. And she asks as if it never existed. She's unimpressed. Out of sight, out of mind. That's because she has yet to develop the capacity for knowing that she is separate. In her world, she's the one who cries and the one who comforts her. It never even occurs to her that she's not everything. But one day, you pick up that same rattle, and when you hide it under her tray, she responds differently. She frowns. She makes complaining sounds. She stretches to look over the edge of the tray. She has the brand new thought, that rattle still exists, and I want to see it again. There it is, the first glimmer of a separate self, self as separate from all else. What Mary's describing is a necessary part of human development, but when you think about it, it's a really vulnerable place to live in this feeling like I'm all alone, one object in this wild and woolly universe of objects. It's a way of knowing that naturally makes for wanting to control things. The problem is we've gotten stuck in thinking of ourselves as separate. For 2,000 years, especially in science, we've used subject-object thinking as our primary tool for figuring out how the world works. But if you just come to see the world as a collection of objects, that's a really limited view of reality. We've relied on it too much, and that's left us in a big mess. And it's a mess that if we continue with it, will only push us 
mindlessly toward demise, of our species at least. War, poverty, violence, oppressions of all kinds are symptoms. But more immediate still is the way our disconnection equates to anxiety and loneliness. What we want you to know is the way our investigation and experience keep showing us the reliable instructions the natural world has for all of us, for reclaiming our kinship with the natural world, for seeing that we belonged all along. Let me tell you a story about kinship that's taught us a lot. It's 1995 on a small mountain stream in northern Yellowstone. For 70 years, elk have been hanging out on the banks, eating sedges and mountain bluebells and geraniums and willow. In fact, in some places, they've eaten so much that those plants have disappeared. And with the roots gone, the banks have crumbled. And other creatures that have been depending on those plants have vanished. That same year, 1995, the wolves come back. The elk grow wary. They move off those stream banks to places with better views, more running room. With the elk off the banks, the flowers and the willow gradually come back. And with the willow, pretty soon the beavers are able to find happy homes in that stream again. And the ponds the beavers build provide perfect habitat for song sparrows and yellow throats to come back to. This is the point. What seemed a reasonable human initiative at the time, the eradication of wolves, turned out to be problematic. But we had a chance to correct the problem, restore balance to the ecosystem, and we did it. Scores of social scientists have shown us how stories like this one in Yellowstone are the human story, too. They're your story. Anything that affects one aspect of an ecosystem affects every other aspect. It changes the whole system. It changes you. Often in small, incremental ways, but sometimes in big, obvious ways, always changing. We are interdependent. Humans, wolves, trees, and like all of life, we're fundamentally programmed to thrive. Full ecology offers us the chance to be in full relationship with who we are as nature itself. What would it feel like to break down the walls between you, your mind, and the natural world? What would it be like to come to rest to reclaim your human nature, to be finally, fully home. Thank you. Thank you all.